Hi everyone, Fide Master Dennis Monacrucis here, and um, we're going to do something that's a little bit of the opposite of what we had done um, for a whole series of shows, which was looking at a very sharp opening, where, um, well, not only was it an opening, not only was it very sharp, but um, tactics were, in some variations, just about everything. So here we have practically the opposite kind of situation in almost every way. It's an endgame, and particular moves aren't so important, and tactics are at a minimum. What really counts here is thinking schematically, trying to figure out what to do step by step and to make progress in that way. Now, this is a, a pretty routine kind of ending. This exact position, okay, I don't think I've ever seen a position exactly like this, but this type of ending is relatively common. Now, this example I got from the new book um, called Chess Strategy for Club Players by uh, International Master Herman Groten, and, uh, but I've seen very similar um, exercises, and I tried really hard to find one of them. I think it was in one of the, the Bilyovsky and Michal Shishin books on the endgame, but I was unable to find it there. So, um, you know, I looked in some Dvoretsky books, and I found some examples that are, are pretty interesting, and I'll, I'll mention those after we look at this. But, um, and also there's a very, very famous example, which I'll also um, briefly mention at the end. But anyway, this looked like a, a convenient sort of um, instance, and uh, I'll give this to you as a problem here, first of all. So I would definitely suggest writing down the position and trying to figure it out, or trying to, f try to figure out how white should win. So try to figure the whole thing out from start to finish, and of course attempt to look for the most challenging um, defenses for black. Okay, well, let's discuss this. Of course, white is much better. Uh, the reason for this is, well, first of all, is king is much better placed than black, so white's king is in black's half of the board. Black's king is entirely passive, and really its only function is to try to prevent white's king from getting at the black pawns. Another very important point in white's favor, of course, is this good knight, which can go on to light squares or dark squares, whereas, obviously, black's bishop is limited to light squares, or dark squares, excuse me, and can't touch any of white's pawns on the light squares. So this is a very big deal. So between these two and the possibility of white's driving black's king further and further um, into passivity, white ought to be able to win this. But working out the details is um, a useful task. Okay, well, the first thing you might think is, why not knight to b3 and then knight to a5 check with the idea of driving the king over to c7, and then you can play king a6, and hey, we've made further progress then. The problem, though, is if you play knight to b3 here, black simply plays bishop to c3, and... Knight takes c5 wouldn't be good enough to win. Um, I don't think white would lose there, though he might, but certainly he's not going to win that. And if knight to a5 check, well, black just takes, and he has the opposition. So no real worries over here. And, um, yeah, so that, that suffices for draw. So knight to b3 doesn't make progress, and knight to a5 would just be an outright uh, error, a very serious error at that. Okay, so... <clears throat> we need to bring the knight around some other way. Well, what I'm going to do first is show you what happened when I played this against um, Ribka. And this is also kind of amusing because it shows just how um, bad computers are in certain kinds of positions. Of course, they're vastly superior to us in, in many other positions, in the majority of positions. But there are some positions that they simply don't get. So I played knight to f3. And, um, okay, well, let me, let me discuss the winning procedure and um, what it entails. So, again, the first thing we need to do is drive the black king over. If we can't use a5, what we're going to try to use instead is d8. And, in fact, what we can do is try to maneuver the knight to c6. And at that point, black is facing a dilemma. He needs to keep knight a5, or the a5 square under control, but that means that he's going to have to allow knight to d8 check. Because no, there shouldn't be any way for him to get his bishop to b6 safely. I mean, that's, uh, as we'll see, that, that can't be done. 
Okay, well what happens after knight to d8 check? So the knight goes from c6 to d8, black plays king to c7, and at first glance it might seem as if this isn't any progress at all, because when the knight moves, black brings the king back to b7. So the solution then is to play the knight to f7. So this is how we make our first bit of progress. All right, so let's let's see this in action. Okay, so first against Ribka, and this was actually dramatically simple. So bishop to d4, and okay, it just volunteered. So right off the top, we have a bad move from Ribka. So of course, I very happily played king a6. So now I made further progress. Now the next thing that I want to do is to chase his king yet further away, and the best way to do that is to drop my knight onto the e6 square. So then he has to either allow my king to b6 or to b7. Well, okay, he has to allow it to b6 no matter what. b7 might be, in some cases, even better. So that's the next bit of progress. So I place here, play here, bishop b5, knight f8, bishop g3, knight e6 check. Okay, success. Plays king c8, I come over, and now if my king comes to c6, well, that's more progress. So correctly, Ripka stops it. All right, well now, what's the next thing we have to do? We can't win any pawns until our king at least gets to c6, so we have to drive the black king further away. Very simple, very logical. So how do I do it? If I play knight to f8 check, he attacks the knight, I have to move the knight away, and he comes back to d7. So that's not going to be the solution. Well, where else can I check the king? Very important to realize that even though I want to move my king to c6, it's okay to take an intermediate step and go to b7 first, clearing b6 for the knight. All right, so don't be, um, don't don't let yourself get overly influenced by where a piece is, um, even if it's going somewhere else. So it's you know be flexible about that. So king to b7, clear the space for the knight. Bishop b5, knight c7, bishop f4, knight a8 and knight to b6 check. Ta-da! Success. Okay, so computer played king to d8, I played king to c6. All right, well what's next? So here we need to figure out how to attack this pawn in a way where black has to react. See the thing is, okay, I can bring the knight to b7 and maybe that's what I should do. Okay, but then he plays king to e7 and he'll have the bishop supporting the pawn. So of course he's going to take care of that. And then how do I make progress from there? So if he's going to have his bishop on f4, how do I finish him off here? How do I push his king away? Well, what I have to do, since I want my knight to go to c8, see that's the trick. If I can get my knight to c8, then I win the d6 pawn. So what I have to do is get c7 for my king. All right, so that's the trick here. I need to get c7 for the king, and then once I do that, then I can maneuver my knight to c8. So let's watch how it works. Bishop to a5, knight to d7, threatening the pawn, king e7, knight to b8, and here uh, the computer is in Zugzwang. So bishop to d2, and uh, actually, yeah, I didn't play king to c7 yet. I probably could have, but I had a different idea. So knight a6, knight c7, knight b5, so I force his bishop passively here, so it's not going to bother me if I play king c7. I don't have to worry about bishop to a5 check anymore. So now I play king to c7, bishop h2, knight a7, king f8. Okay, again, uh, another poor move, giving me progress, but what can it do? I mean, there's really nothing for it to do. The better try would be king to e8, but actually this isn't better either, because knight c8, and um, okay, what black should do here is try a little trick, bishop to g3. So what should white do here? If you said play knight takes d6, then you're going to be in for a painful surprise when black plays king to e7, and we lose on account of the pin. So knight takes d6 would be a blunder. The right move is king c6. And now black is defenseless against knight takes d6, and white wins. So the game was similar, or the game, the, uh, our little playoff was similar, played king to f8. But now, again, I took advantage, so there's no, no reason to, um, 
not get the maximum. So I play king to d7. And now we see the idea. The computer wants to counterattack here. So king g7, and he wants to balance out to h6, to g5, and so on. So this needs to be taken into account as well, but it turns out that everything is quite simple. So knight to c8, king h6, and here I thought about playing king to e6, but I realized that there really isn't any threat from black to win the f-pawn. So knight takes d6, and the point is that if black plays um, king to g5, this is no trouble at all. I'll play king to e6, and next move comes knight to e4 check. Unless black takes, but if we just look at the race, I win it. So I can simply do that, or I could play king to e7. I mean, that's perfectly fine as well. And I promote first with an extraordinarily easy win. I mean, I'm just so many tempi ahead, it's preposterous for black to, to continue to resist here. So after knight takes d6, Ribka played bishop to g1, and it's just trivial. Knight to e4, bishop h2, king e6, and I decided to, to put the computer out of its misery at this point. All right, so that's the basic uh, scheme here. Let's see what it looks like against the best possible resistance, though. So after knight to f3, black should, of course, not give ground with the king. That's just much too cooperative. Oops, sorry. Um, let's try this again. Knight f3, bishop c3, knight h4, bishop d2, knight g6, bishop h6. So, okay, trying to prevent the king, the knight from getting to, to f8. But no problem. Knight e7, bishop e2, knight c6. So that's where I had to get, remember? c6 with the dual threat of knight a5 and knight to d8. Okay, so black can only cover the one square. So bishop c3, check, here, knight f7. And again, if the king moves, d6 drops. Well, if the king moves back to b7, and if it doesn't move back to b7, then my king, or the white king, starts to, to crowbar its way in to a6, and it's going to start turning the corner here. Okay, so next step, drive the king from c7, so that our king gets b to b6 or b7. Okay, so bishop f4. And the way to do it, again, is to maneuver the knight to e6. So we're going to go for this. This is the goal. If we can't make that route, we'll try another one, but that's the, uh, that's the aim. So here, here, here. And you see black resists. All right, so now we have to figure out another way to get to a square that will drive the king away. And the answer is, well b5. So there's e6 and there's b5. Basically any square that gives us a safe check will do the trick. So how do we get to b5? Well, we go to e7, c6, a7, and then b5. Okay, so here, 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 here. And we did it. So again, all these these maneuvers take a while, but once you realize what you got to do, it's actually very easy to figure them out. And it's a good exercise to try to do so. Okay, so king c8, king b6, king d7, again, not allowing king to c6. Okay, so now we play king to b7, and it's time to work the knight around to b6. Or you could go to b8, so that's also possible. So knight, oops, knight c7, a6, b8. Whatever we need to do to secure c6 for our king. So that's stage three. So bishop b5, here, here. Okay, now, notice, if black plays bishop to a5, well, we can play knight to b6 check anyway, because the pawn ending, once the king is in, is a trivial win. So there's not really any such thing as opposition in these kinds of situations, because you just do this, and white can even win all three pawns if he so desires. Okay, so bishop to e5, returning to the defense of the uh, d-pawn. Check. Okay, and now, all right, if king to d8, king c6, bishop g3, Knight to d7, king c7. So again, that same idea. We get our king here. We bring the knight around to here. We're actually more likely... Sorry, we go b6 and c8. So bishop f4, knight b6. And there's nothing that black can do to save the pawn. All right, well, we'll look at something very similar in a moment. So after knight to b6 check, let's say king to e7. Okay, king c6. And now black plays king to d8. So still putting up resistance. Of course, if he doesn't, then we play knight c6, knight takes d6. But after king to d8, well, we still have to push the king further over so our king can get to c7. 
and then play knight to c8. All right, so how do we do this? So think about this. Well, we have to find some way to, to, to check the king here. We've got to force it to, to e7. How do we do that? Well, we do that by attacking the pawn on d6 a second time. All right, well, how do we do that? Well, we can maneuver the knight to b5, uh, b7, excuse me, or to b5. And b5 is actually quite simple because we can get there via the c7 square and black's bishop can't get in the way. So we'll play uh, knight a8, knight c7, knight to b5. And then black will have to play king e7 and then we get king c7 in and then it's on to the next stage. Okay, so here we go. And black has to play king e7, king c7. Okay, so now, once again, the idea is to play the knight to c8. And it's very obvious how we're going to do that. Black can do nothing to prevent it. And then again, we have our final little hurdle to clear. We do not want to play knight takes d6 because after king to e7, probably black is winning this, uh, almost 100% certain. And certainly white's not winning it. So we play king c6. So we get out of the way of the pin. Black's king can't protect the d6 pawn. And so now everything is just very simple. King d8, knight takes d6, followed by king c5 or knight e4 and takes, or you know, can do any one of a number of things, all of which will lead to a very simple and straightforward win. All right, so that's our basic example. Um, we'll take a look here at a second example. And this is <clears throat> a, an analysis by, I believe it's Nikolai Grigoriev, in, um, done in 1931. And it's based on a game from a match between Sultan Khan and Tartikover, also played in that same year. So if you look that up in the databases, um, the fifth game of their match, I believe this exact position arose, except that black did not have a pawn on e6. So that position inspired Grigoriev to look at this um, this um, setup here, and to try to see if there was a way for white to win this. So this one is actually much more complicated, um, but still there's some very similar kinds of ideas. So of course the idea is to bring the king in, force black's king back, and win using, um, you know, win eventually by turning the corner and getting at black's pawns. But this is a much tougher exercise. So again, uh, I recommend that you stop the recording, try to work it out as best as you possibly can. Okay, well, let's have a look. So we start, of course, with knight to a4 check. We, so we force the black king to give some ground. And if he goes to a6, it's actually very easy. We just play king to c5. And notice that black's king can't come out just yet. And after something like bishop to g8, knight e2 is a good move. So again, we uh, put the knight into its best defensive square. So away from um, any tempo gaining moves by black like king to b4. And after this, now the white king comes in. And we can see that the, uh, the black bishop is trapped. And in the king and pawn um, ending, white wins the race very easily. So for instance, um, let's say king to d3. Maybe white could even consider something like knight to c1 check, but probably the simplest to do this. And white will win. So you can see he's going to end up queening first. And while such endings are trivial wins, even if we um, just play defensively, it's um, even simpler just to give up the queen for the pawn. So we can play like this. Here, just to gain a tempo, take, and and so on, and just promote the pawn. So a very simple variation there. Okay, so king a6 is not really a very intuitive move in any case. So king c6 is the way to go. All right, so now we make progress, king a5. And let's say black plays king to b7. Okay, so what should black, sorry, what should white do here? Be careful. If you play king to b5, which would normally be quite appealing, bishop to e8 check is an instant draw. So bishop takes a4, and then black gets the opposition dead draw. Kind of like the variation we looked at the last time with knight to b3, 
and then knight to a5 check at the very beginning of the exercise. So quite similar, and this is uh, dead draw. So knight c5 check. All right, now black has a choice. Let's start with king to a7, staying in front of the king. All right, well, how does white win in this case? Well, one thing to realize, and this is sometimes useful, surprisingly useful, is to, to ask yourself in a position like this, what if it were my opponent's move? See, the first thing you might notice is if king to b5, black has bishop to e8 check. Seems to just drive us back. We're, making, we're not making any progress. So what do we do? If we move our knight, well, black will move the bishop. Or he could play his king back to b7. On the other hand, if it was black's move, if his king moves, we win very easily. The king comes into b6, and then c6, d6, and we win the e-pawn. Or if black moves the bishop, that's not favorable for him either. Because if he goes to e8, he drops the e6-pawn. And if he goes to g8, then we can play king b5 followed by king to c6 and win. So that's the answer. What we have to do is we have to force it to be black's move. How do we do that? Well, the wonders of triangulation come into play. So king to b5, bishop e8 check, and now king to b4. See, black's bishop has to return to f7, otherwise the pawn falls, unless he plays bishop to d7 and loses the bishop instead. So bishop to f7, and now king a5. See, we did it. We triangulated. And now we got the position we wanted with black to move, and it's hopeless. So bishop to g8, king b5, and the king walks in, c6, d6, and knight takes e6. Easy win. All right. So instead, black should probably play king to c7 or king to c6. Let's just play king to c7. And now king to b5. So another very nice little finesse. Uh, black does not want to play bishop to g8 here, but okay. Bishop to e8 check, king a6, bishop f7. All right, so once again, we've got a position where we need to figure out what to do. So here we have really, this is really the most complicated moment of the whole exercise. So here's where it's kind of tough. Because it looks like the king on, on c7 is just the rock of Gibraltar. I mean, how do we break him down here? Well, the answer is quite surprising. What we do is this. We play knight to b7. Okay, black can play bishop to e8. And now we play king a7. Seems kind of bizarre. But we'll, we'll, we'll figure out a bit at a time what exactly white is up to. Now, one simple way of thinking about this is that we're putting the black king into a kind of a zugzwang. Because if the king comes up to c6, then we can run around the back door here, go king to b8, king c8, and penetrate that way. Conversely, if black plays king to c8, well, then we play king to b6, and we're making further progress. Okay, but well, well, let's take a look at this first. So, for example, if king to c6, king to b8. Okay, king to b6, king c8, bishop f7. And now, again, we have to be a little bit careful. I mean, black wants to play king b5, king c4, king d4, and grab our pawns. So, knight to d6 is a very useful move. We cut off the b5 square. Our knight's not hanging anymore. We're attacking his bishop. And our king can now make further progress. So, bishop g8. King d7, king a5, but white's in time. So we just ignore, we leave the knight where it is, and we go after the bishop. King e7, king b4, king f8, king c3, and now knight b5 check. So the knight is less valuable than the pawns at this point. So knight to b5, here, takes, and again, white wins the race. And this is a useful point to notice, that when you've got these situations with blocked pawns, if your pawns are further advanced, that often means that you're going to have a head start in any kind of race, like this one. Okay, so let's go back to here. So we saw king to c6, king b8, white breaks through. But all right, black should just wait here, play bishop to f7. Now what does white do? Well, we can make some more progress with knight to d6, driving the bishop back. Bishop to g8, king a6. And again, black is in kind of a, a zugzwang here. Notice, if he plays bishop to h7, then we have knight to e8 check, followed by knight to f6 check. Well, it doesn't matter if it's check or not. Knight to f6 comes next. 
and this poor bishop on h7 is just trapped and lost. So that's a big problem for, for black, that this is a, a threat. Well, it's a threat if the bishop goes to h7. Bishop can't go to f7, and if black's king goes to d7, then the king goes, our king goes to b6, and we win. So king c6 is forced. Okay, but now what? It looks like we're just kind of going back and forth here. Well, after king to a5, we're making progress. Because if king to c7, we play king to b5. And again, black is in this kind of permanent zugzwang. He can't play bishop to h7 because of knight e8, knight f6. If he goes, if he plays king to d7, king to b6. And again, we're, we're breaking in. So back here, bishop to h7 is probably the best that black can do. But it looks like it's okay, because if knight to e8, he just goes back to g8. So try to figure out what white can do here. So this, this takes a little leap of imagination at this point. Now, bear in mind that black's king is running out of moves. So it's not going to take us much more by way of penetration before we can uh, break down his resistance. But for, for now, he can still fight. Um, sufficiently against the uh, the king and knight combo. So we have to drive him back a little bit more first. And the answer is a really neat one. It's knight to f7. And on bishop to g8, we play knight to h8. So very funny. Black has to play bishop to h7. And now with king to a6, we make the decisive progress. King to c7 is the best try. And now king to b5. Okay, now black doesn't want to play king to d7 because after king to b6, the king then gets to c6 and can probably just walk its way all the way over. So black has to play king to b7, king c5, king c7. And now we can't make any more progress with our king. We need the knight again, but we've made enough progress with the king that the knight will do the job. So knight f7, bishop g8, knight to d6. Unfortunately, black can't move the bishop to f7 because it would hang. He can't move the king, can't afford to move the king because then we make decisive progress. So if king to d7, king to b6, and now we basically have the same kind of situation as in the previous um, example. So now we'll play knight b7, knight c5 check, and the king gets to, to c6 with the idea of going to, uh, to d6. If black plays king e7, we'll play king c6, and then put the knight on c6 or c8, and so on. So well, we can look at this kind of quickly here. Okay, so king b6. Let's say black plays bishop to h7. Um, knight to b7. Bishop g8. Knight c5. Sorry, knight c5. King e7. King c7. Okay, what does black do? Say bishop to f7. Uh, now we want to maneuver the knight to c6 or c8. Probably They're probably equivalent. So let's go here does whatever, knight to d6, doesn't matter if he can swap or not, knight c6 check, because again if he takes, we win the e-pawn very easily, so king e8, king d6, king d7, and all the pawns fall. So after knight to c6 check, king e8 is forced, king d6, let's say bishop to c8, okay, now we just have to attack this guy, so what do we do? Bring the knight to c5 if we can, or to c7. Uh, what's going to be the best route? So let's say knight here. Yeah, because you can't stop knight e3, c5. Or, you know, even knight f4 could be good in some cases, too. So, all right, what does he do? Knight bishop there, here, here, knight c5, king f7, and now king c7 traps the bishop. So that's uh, convincing, but even if the bishop could go, let's say, not to a6, but let's say one one file further over, um, that would be okay. We could still play king to d7 or king to d6. Well, yeah, king d7 would do the job, and um, that should win too. So anyway, this is a good illustration of how white can win. So going back here, we just saw what happens on king d7, king b6, and so on. But let's see the end of this. So bishop to h7, and of course now we know what white does. Check. Knight f6, goodbye bishop, 
and goodbye to all of Black's Pawns as well. All right, so this is a, a kind of a fun sort of exercise. I mean, it's always fun when the opponent has no counterplay whatsoever. But these kind of endings do occur. Uh, clearly, in, in a French defense, this sort of ending is uh, quite capable of, of taking place. And there are other instances and other openings as well. Um, if you want to pursue this topic further, a couple of games that I can suggest that you look up. One is Dolmatov against Drasko from Sochi in 1988. And there's also a very, very famous game, Karpov against Kasparov from their first World Championship match in 1984, Game 9. So that is a, a, a perfect example of this sort of ending. It's been analyzed in tremendous detail by, by many people. Uh, Karsten Mueller has annotated it uh, numerous times. Mark Tvoretsky has annotated it. Of course, um, Karpov and Kasparov have annotated this game. And I, I'm sure there are other sources as well. I, I think in the world's greatest chess games, um, Burgess or Nunn or Ems or I think Gallagher is the fourth author, one of them looks at this game as well. So you can find many places uh, where it, it's been looked at in, in quite a lot of detail, including some very good online sources. So check that out, and um, you can use that to, to really consolidate your knowledge um, and understanding of this kind of ending. So I hope this is helpful. It's, um, again, it's sort of we, we've been looking at maybe somewhat idealized cases of this ending, but the idealized cases actually do occur in this good knight versus bad bishop scenario. So, again, hopefully it's helpful. Those of you who uh, were not big fans of uh, the long opening series, well, now you've got something um, that I hope will be more, more to your taste. So, anyway, thank you very much. Um, check out my blog, chessmind.powerblogs.com. So, should be lots of good stuff there for you. And I will see you next time. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.